We continue to make progress in improving outcomes for metastatic hepatic cell carcinoma as therapeutic options are ever increasing. However, with increased options comes increased complexity in making treatment decisions for a given patient. In this Oncolive Exchange discussion, Evolving Treatment Paradigms for Metastatic Liver Cancer, I'm joined by a panel of experts in gastrointestinal oncology. Today, we'll sort out through the most recent data and will provide a practical perspective on current approaches for treatment. I'm Gassana Bolfa, attending physician at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center and professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. And joining me today are Dr. Anthony Kuwery, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at University of Southern California Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center and Phase One Program Director in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Catherine Fernat, Director of the Liver and Hepatic Cell Carcinoma Program at the Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center in La Jolla, California. Dr. Pierre Goulam, Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and Director of the Hepatobiliary Tumor Multidisciplinary Team at the Seedman Cancer Center in Cleveland, Ohio and Dr. Ahmed Kasseb, Professor in the Department of Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology, Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you, let's begin. So, so Catherine, you and I have this discussion all the time. And if anything, we understand that HCC, the standard that all our colleagues will be kind of be recognizant of is hepatitis B related liver cancer, hepatitis C liver cancer, alcoholic liver cancer, and then we bring in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. What's, what's NASH? So NASH is becoming a very common cause of liver cancer in the United States. There's actually areas in the country that it's become the most common cause. NASH is a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So patients with the metabolic syndrome and metabolic dysregulation with insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, central obesity, they develop steatosis in the liver that then stimulates inflammation and fibrosis development that can then result in cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, liver cancer, and is really becoming a huge problem in the United States. Well, understandably so. And um, let's, let's see like, if the medical oncologist, like, so Anthony, are you seeing those patients? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So more and more in our clinic, we are seeing patients who are potentially middle-aged, but with metabolic syndrome and no other predisposing risk factors, sometimes even without cirrhosis, who are presenting with, with hepatocellular carcinoma. Incredible. And uh, Ahmed, in your kind of, you know, uh, practice, and you see a lot of HCC patients, uh, like if you were to put like percentages, like how many people that come out of 100, how many will be NASH-related HCC? Yeah, so um, about 15, 20 years ago, the uh, percentage was really focusing on hepatitis C and hepatitis B alcohol-related. I would say in the last decade, we've seen a major shift. So um, after at least 50% of patients are non-hepatitis related nowadays in our clinic, and the rest are about 30% hep C, 10, 15% hep B. Fair enough. So we're seeing more and more of this, uh, which is quite amazing. So now, uh, Peter, uh, the important complexity of liver cancer is that truly it's a two diseases in one. And you as a hepatologist, uh, what can you teach us like as oncologists and like regarding to that cirrhotic component? What's it, what is it and what do we do about it? Right. I think as you pointed out, there are competing risks in patients who have... Uh, cirrhosis and HCC, uh, and in a sense, sometimes the underlying liver disease may be the predominant uh, risk factor for morbidity and mortality. And I think the astute treating physician needs to be aware of this and understand that in the setting of very advanced liver disease, uh, the focus should be on trying to improve both quantity and quality of life to the, on that component as opposed to focusing as much on cancer. I know this is primarily a discussion about cancer, yeah. but uh, having the full picture is very important in those patients. Fair enough. And so, Catherine, uh, of course, one thing I can do, which is easy, there's a good answer on the board, uh, you consult the hepatologist. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to play hepatologist a little bit ourselves too. So a patient with quote-unquote liver cancer slash cirrhosis, let's say hep C patients with cirrhosis, mm -hmm. How do I assess how bad is bad the cirrhosis? Do, is there any specific metric I use? Uh, what, 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 what do we do? 
There's several metrics that we can yeah. use. We're all very comfortable and used to using the Child Pew score. Fair. It's been around for 40 or 50 years and looks at you know both symptoms with ascites and encephalopathy as well as lab values with albumin, bilirubin, and INR. Yeah. Um, I think the performance status is still very ap applicable in patients with cirrhosis. We also look at the MELD score model for end-stage liver disease. Yeah. And then also more and more in cancer treatments, we're looking at the ALBI score. Mm -hmm. So these are all various things that we can use to really evaluate the underlying liver disease. And in my mind, one of the critical things when you're starting the evaluation of a patient with cancer is also to evaluate the cirrhosis mm -hmm. and see what you can do to maintain the liver function as long as possible to then allow the patient to get the benefit of further therapies for their cancer. Fair enough.